What's really going on in this reality? You can't handle the truth. What is it? Being human's a video game, bro. The science and the spirituality both align. Okay, buddy. What do you want? Do you want the gov to come out and say, hey guys, you're in a video game? It's not gonna happen. We have to do the research ourselves to find the truth. All right, fine, let's get into it. What's the evidence then? In Hindu philosophy, they refer to the world as Leela, which in Sanskrit means the divine play of God. And think thousands of years ago when they had like plays, live action plays, you know, people still do that shit on Broadway sometimes, I guess. I mean, I'm not trying to talk shit. <laughs> And think about how a dramatic play can be interpreted as a video game. They're just in different contexts. And also any religion that believes in an afterlife of any kind can be also interpreted as layers of a video game. So you could say that Christianity and Islam are describing the world as a video game, but just God's video game with specific rules. But Buddhism and Hinduism align with this too, because they both have their own take on a concept called samsara, or that we take rebirths until we alleviate our karma. Doesn't that kind of sound like respawning in a game on a specific level until you've completed it? All right, now give me some science why we're in a video game. Okay, we'll come back to some of that stuff, but some of the scientific evidence is, for example, number one, you've got Oxford philosopher Nick Bostrom. In 2003, he wrote a paper called are you living in a computer simulation? And he proposed the idea that one of these has to be true. Number one, all human-like civilizations in the universe go extinct before they develop the technological capacity to create simulated realities. Or, number two, if any civilizations do reach this phase of technological maturity, none of them will bother to run simulations. Or, number three, advanced civilizations would have the ability to create many, many simulations. And that means that there are far more simulated worlds than non-simulated worlds. And there can only be one base reality, and beyond that, everything is simulation. And the probability that we are in a simulated universe, or a video game, so to speak, is very, very high. So to sum that up, we either all become unalived before we can create lifelike simulations, or we decide to never make them even though we can, or we're in one right now. And you've seen plenty of famous physicists come out and say, we don't have a good argument against simulation theory. <laughs> But to me, when you're saying the simulation theory, you're saying the video game theory. I'm not trying to say that we're all AI. That's not what I'm getting at. Yikes. I don't like the idea that we're in a video game because it makes things seem less real. What do you define as real? Because what we think is real often is not close to what reality actually is. It's more of a user interface. So it may feel like you're experiencing this reality, and I would say you relatively are. You, you really are experiencing it. Just like when you're playing a video game and you're really experiencing the video game. So saying that reality is a video game doesn't imply that the physical reality isn't a real experience, but rather it's just an aspect of experience and there's more beyond it. Hmm. Let's go a step even deeper. Think about this. If I put you into a video game, like a VR video game, you can recognize that there's a part of your awareness that knows that it's in a video game while it's playing, right? There's a, it's basically, there's a part that's like, hey, I'm in a video game. Well, what if I found a way to numb that part of your awareness for a while? So let's say for 60 seconds, and what would reality be like in those 60 seconds? You wouldn't know where you came from or what's going on. Now think about your birth. You were born without being able to recall where you came from in that same exact way. But if this is true, why is it so hard for humans to understand this truth? Because that's part of how the game was programmed to be. And Donald Hoffman, who wrote the book, The Case Against Reality, outlined this beautifully. He said that the world presented to us by our perceptions is nothing like reality. We have evolution to thank for this illusion as it maximizes evolutionary fitness by driving truth to extinction. In other words, reality is not meant to show us the truth because the truth is not convenient to survival. It's as though it's hidden on purpose so that we actually survive in the game. You know, this would actually be a cool video game design because it would make it exciting to figure out the truth while only a few other people know it. We haven't even covered the different expansion packs yet, but you're totally right. Okay, well, here's the big question. What does this mean for religion? It doesn't mean religion is wrong per se, but we just have to take a different approach with it. Think about the different time periods and the metaphors that were available depending on the technological advancements of that civilization. For example, I remember Joseph Campbell talking about the Vedic texts, the Upanishads. He said, Brahma sits on a lotus, the symbol of divine energy and divine grace. The lotus grows from the navel of Vishnu, who is the sleeping god, whose dream is the universe. Brahma opens his eyes and the world comes into being. Brahma closes closes his eyes and a world goes out 
of being. So if you call reality a dream, that's still valid. It's just a different metaphor for the same truth. In a dream, you numb the ability to remember where you came from in the same way I described with the VR headset. But here's another interesting part. You can learn in our reality to lucid dream, meaning you can remember where you came from outside the dream and have access to that memory. Well, maybe in our reality, some people can do the same thing. They remember before the human game, just like a lucid dream. Or during the game, they realize that they're gaming in the same way you can realize that you're dreaming. And that's what lucid dreaming is, right? Like you're awake in the dream, just like you could realize that you're playing a video game during the video game. Interesting, this definitely could be possible, but what would the end of this life be like then? It would just be a remembering, a remembering of the rest of you outside the game, and you would gain that part of your awareness back, like it would become unnumbed. And from a lot of different sources, there seems to be a so-called astral realm, which is the next step or the next level that you go back to. It's kind of like the lobby of the video game, and it's been called many things for thousands of years, and you can find references to the alternate dimensions from which we come and go in ancient Egyptian text, Tibetan text, and Indian text, such as the Tibetan Book of the Dead, the Egyptian Book of the Dead, or the Upanishads. But if you were to think those are the only cultures that talk about that experience, you'd be wrong. Even ancient Greeks were into it. They described it as metempsychosis and described it as the soul is the immortal part that passes through the different cycles of incarnation in birth and release from the body at death. The behavior of the individual during a particular life can determine the form the soul takes in the next life. The theory of the soul derived from the teachings of Pythagoras, yes, the math guy, who is said to actually have gotten it from Indian texts. In the Phaedrus, Plato describes this theory of the immortal soul, arguing that after the death of the body, the soul passes passes through the realm of the ideas, which is why it's possible for us to possess particular kinds of knowledge, such as the consciousness of virtue and perfection through the process of anamnesis or recollection. And in Orphism, which was a Greek mystical religious movement, it was believed that the newly dead who drank from the river Lethe would lose all memory from their past existence. The initiated were taught to seek instead the river of memory, thus securing the end of what was referred to as the transmigration of the soul. All that sounds a lot like playing a video game, taking a break, then getting part of your memory wiped for you to go back into the game. So then what's the point of life on earth then if it's just a game? That's a hard question to answer because it's just not that simple. Two truths can be true simultaneously. For example, the point of your life at this moment from the soul point of view might be to complete the game of being human by playing it at a high level. And there's a threshold in which you'd reach to move on. But simultaneously from an even higher point than that, the point might just be to play the game itself for the sake of playing. It's like asking a group of gamers, why do you play? Some play because they enjoy it. Some play to spend time with their friends. Some play because they feel less lonely when they play. Some play because they just enjoy challenging games. All these are valid reasons to play, right? And I think on a human level, how or why someone is currently playing depends on their past karma or past actions from this life or the one before it or many lives before it. So after all of that, what is base reality then? Is it the soul? No, 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 no. The soul is a game just like being human is a game. Base reality is what a lot of people call God. And Paramahansa Yogananda described this beautifully. He said that the unmanifested absolute cannot be described except that it was the knower, the knowing, and the known existing as one. In it, the being, cosmic consciousness, and its omnipotence all were without differentiation, ever existing, ever conscious, ever newly joyous spirit. Spirit, being the only existing substance, had not but itself with which to create. Spirit and its universal creation could not be essentially different, for two ever existing infinite forces would consequently each be absolute, which is by definition an impossibility. An orderly creation requires the duality of the creator and created. Thus, spirit first gave rise to a magic delusion, so-called maya, the cosmic magical measurer, which produces the illusion of dividing a portion of the indivisible infinite into separate 
finite objects. Even as a calm ocean becomes distorted into individual waves on its surface by the action of a storm, all creation is nothing but spirit, seemingly and temporarily diversified by spirit's creative vibratory activity. And a quick side note, there's evidence of this in quantum physics with something called wave particle duality. Wave particle duality theory states that waves can exhibit particle-like properties, while particles can exhibit wave-like properties. This definition opposes both classical mechanics and Newtonian physics. And just as something can do that, maybe that describes how the game works. You're simultaneously the human, the soul, and the entire wave function of the universe, of creation. Why do I suffer so much, though? That's a whole nother chat, but I think that Alan Watts summed it up best in the best one-liner I've ever heard. He said, man only suffers because he takes seriously what the gods do for fun. All right, I hope you enjoyed that breakdown of the simulation slash video game theory. It's one of my favorites of all time. And by the way, I actually have a lot more evidence, but I just didn't want to make the video too long. So if you enjoyed the video, you got value from it, stick around, subscribe. We got plenty more coming. Oh, and real quick, if you want a deeper understanding of not only how we're in a game, but how the game works and how to play it at a high level, check out my Upgrade Your Reality course. That's exactly what it is. It's designed to upgrade your internal and external realities, and we've had some amazing, amazing results. So thank you very much, and we'll see you in the next video. And until then, my friend, peace.